Okay, welcome uh, everyone to this uh, uh, Fujita uh, Bantanay Hospital alumni webinar. Uh, welcome to Professor Yoko Kato, uh, who is uh, our mentor, main sponsor for these webinars. Uh, I want to uh, say hi to my co-moderator, uh, Professor Bishnoi Ishu. Hi. And uh, welcome to our speakers. Today we have uh, two uh, very, very interesting topics uh, by our speakers, uh, Professor Daijit Singh and Dr. Dragan Jankovic. Um, we are uh, really very uh, curious to, to hear your talks. Uh, so I think we can start with the introduction of, of our first speaker. So uh, please, uh, issue you can introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you, dear Alberto. So um, I would like to invite uh, my mentor and my teacher and my guide uh, during my MCS training, Professor Daljit Singh. And he is a professor and head of neurosurgery department at Jimmy Pant Hospital, New Delhi, India. And uh, he has published more than 200 publications and wrote 38 book chapters and has received highest medical professional award in India, Dr. B.C. Roy Award. And uh, uh, Dr. Dalji Singh, sir, uh, is a very um, a good endovascular neurosurgeon. And, uh, and then, uh, also, he does very good uh, clipping. And I, I learned my basics from him. And uh, that legacy is continuing. Uh, I am continuing that legacy after uh, learning from him. And uh, Today he will speak uh, another his favorite topic that is uh, neuroethics and he will speak on uh, neuroethics and our responsibilities. So I would like to invite Professor Daldi Singh sir to present his topic. Thank you. Thank you Ishu for those nice introductions. I'm very proud to see you in different forum all together and that gives me immense satisfaction also that uh, our teaching is on the right directions. And I'm very really happy to see the further training you people have had under Professor Kato at Fujita. And I think the process, this is a, you know ongoing process of learning where one should not stop from one place. I keep on going, listening, learning, and keep on improving for the larger benefit of your patient and maybe the new generations of the people who will be trained under you. So I'm very happy and delighted to see that we did the right kind of a training to you. Now coming essentially to my topic, uh, uh, just a second, let me share my screen also. It is rather a boring topic, believe me. You know, quite sedating, no images, no video, but you know, it is uh, something different. And normally it is not discussed in most of the educational forum. And hence it is kept uh, on the sidelines. But I think uh, uh, as you grow older, and if you see more and more responsibility towards uh, colleagues, society, you will find that we have an immense sense of uh, responsibility to our society. And these kinds of uh, talks are mandatory uh, for us to know about it and uh, uh, learn from it and teach to the younger colleagues also. You know, after all, uh, it is not the knowledge of ethics or as well as neuroethics is restricting our job. It just basically gives us the freedom to work uh, in, a, in a legalized manner. And uh, that really helps you to understand the life in a very different perspective altogether. Now, ethics have become uh, a part and parcels of every sphere of uh, uh, you know, working condition, be it a business, be it banking, let it be journalism, hospitality, education, politics, everybody talks that we should work under the domains of its ethical principle. And as far as the medicine is concerned, medicine cannot be an exception, so cannot be the neurosciences. And so ethics is very important. And we all follow it in our clinical trial, research, thesis and publications. That's about generally, which is uh, uh, there. You know, after World War II, and more so some part of World War I also, it was realized that medicos are doing a lot of work for the sake of improving their knowledge 
request for improving upon the treatment profiles, but then they resulted in damaging the uh, human body in a, uh, intentionally and at a time largely unintentionally also. A lot of hue and cry resulted in declaration of Helsinki that what we should uh, do, what we should not do as our medical practices. Now let us uh, understand what is ethic. Ethic is a branch of knowledge that deals in the doctrines of moral values and its principle. It is just not restricting to morality. It covers a wide range of issues which decides our responsibilities toward each other. Now let us differentiate what is morality and ethics. Morality is singular. What I want to do, okay, because I believe in something and hence my moral values is that to do a particular thing. On the same thing, it is if my doing something can damage to a society, a large number of people will be affected because if I do it, then it becomes your ethical values. So ethics covers a large section of the people, group of people, it is plural in nature and hence has a greater uh, impact on the society, whereas morality can be an individual approach. Now, classically, there are four cardinal principle of any ethics. <laughs> they are autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. These are being taught by every institution about the basics. And I think we are all aware about it. The first cardinal principle autonomy results is that an individual should have a freedom to make the decision to accept or refuse any kind of treatment or intervention in the body. Now that's about the autonomy. That's where we play either in informed consent or in informed refusal of a uh, treatment. That is autonomy. Beneficence means if we adopt a particular kind of a treatment, it should benefit to the individual maximally without producing any harm or a minimal harm. Now that's where we, the second uh, cardinal principle, beneficence, comes into play. Third is non-maleficence. That is first do no harm, primum non nocere. That is, if uh, we adopt a treatment or a methodology, it should not produce any harm. That is non-maleficence. And the last is the justice. Justice means it should produce a equal kind of a result under all circumstances, equally and fairly to the all sections of the society. And I think as a neurosurgeons, this is a very important aspect of ethics, which we need to know, learn and propagate also. Now that's justice. I'll try to explain how does this principle come into play for us. Now, neuroethics is an ongoing journal, uh, journey. Now, what is neuroethics? Now, as I said, ethics covers four cardinal principles. Neuroethics is a branch subsection, which has actually been evolving as our ability to understand issues and concern associated with the strides of neurotechnology. Now that's very, very important. All over the world, there is an excessive you know, uh, improvement in technology which interfere with the functions of the brain by virtue of uh, uh, computer brain interface. I'm so sorry. Now there lies the concern about the neuroethics. Now, Devices, which I was trying to tell you, are available, something similar to the um, uh, smart watches. Okay. Now, these kind of uh, devices today are available, which can incite aggression or stop emotions in your brain. That there lies an issue of neuroethics. Now, such mega endeavors in neurotechnologies are increasing knowledge of our brain computer interface are available commercially as well as their military applications are already existing and certainly have raised our concern of humanity toward the unnecessary applications of these devices affecting the human values, autonomy and leading to the imbalance of the social justice. To cite some examples, some of you will be aware. Now, PUBG, player unknown battlegrounds across the world. I saw in India kids committing suicide by playing on to these devices in their uh, computers, in their mobile phone. Now, all of you must have been, you know, concerned about impact of media 
by repeatedly broadcasting certain stereotype messages to the human mind and that is affecting the caste religion color through an alternate social media have you ever wonder what we are doing which part of the brain is getting affected by the use of these devices and how it is affecting that is a new term which is getting coined neuromarketing that is we are exploiting certain areas of the brain by virtue of stimulating them they giving them some pleasure to do something and then creating an impact on the sale of an uh, uh, gadget sale of an item or maybe creating a political unrest among the masses by utilizing this neural technology and thus creating the mass hysteria that is where our concern of neuroethics uh, comes up now there are recognitions of uh, pleasure spots in the brain which are known as hedonic hot spots in the brain cortex and these are orbitofrontal area medial frontal area insula periaqueductal gray area ventral tegmental area nucleus acumens and these are all mediated to dopaminergic uh, pathways now the work is on even in military application to stimulate these areas to inhibit all kinds of uh, fears and so thus you can produce a people who can kill other people by stimulating that area implant microchips in the brain and get them suicide convert them into a suicide bomber and uh, many more similar kind of thing that's a great area of concern for each one of us now wfns international committee did uh, talk about some issues related to it in 2007 they form ethical and medical affair committee now it covered the basic principles when i went through them i found actually it was talking general issues related to uh, ethics they have given about 174 recommendations but then none of these was actually touching about the neuroethics aspect now let us see another aspect of neuroethics is the consent Now, autonomy in medicine presupposes suppose the assumption that the brain of a subject is normal. Now, it has the ability to understand various aspects of the treatment and intervention, and it has a distinct ability to comprehend without any limitation in its function. Now, this is a paramount importance when it comes to taking consent in a non-neurosurgical operation. whereas all neurosurgical patients are bound to have some limitation of its functions beyond motor sensory or language disorders or disabilities and it normally we don't test those executive functions or higher mental functions and we assume that the person has given consent by understanding without subjecting those patient to the test which will actually discern whether they suffer from any kind of a higher mental disorders or any of those things which will affect their uh, process of thinking or you may produce a person with an intact uh, motor sensory and language functions but a person is different after the surgery that's concern of the neuroethics now um this term neuroethics was coined by the pulitzer prize winner uh, william safire it's a very recent term 2002 and uh, it says that it focuses on the ethical concerns arising of the attempts to better understanding the function of the brain resulting in the invasion of the brain of an individual monitoring about his thought dana foundation is a foundation of ngo which is working on this across the world and they are bringing this into the knowledge of most of the people now essentially it also you know there are certain things we can interfere or manipulate the function of the brain positively by enhancing or negatively by uh, decreasing the function this is known as cognitive enhancement and cognitive ablations now let us try to further understand cognitive enhancement means what several drugs are available which can improve the function of the brain it can improve the memory like drugs like uh, available like oxytocin which has been used in adhd this is attention deficit hypertonic hyperactive disorder in children there are neurostimulator available which can be implanted in the brain to improve the function mental capacity endurance which is something similar or and the brain is essentially normal this is something like 
giving anabolic steroid to the athlete to improve the function in various Olympics or the game competition, which is a banned item. Now, something similar to that, the functioning is going on, which can improve the memory, which can improve the functioning, and it can produce a slave of its own kind to improve the productivity in the industry. And this kind of work is already going on. Another arena is uh, use of functional MRI. Now, we all know functional MRI is a very, very useful item, but then many people have started objecting to this. It is a breach of my privacy, like what I'm thinking, what I'm performing, why should anybody else would know? And, you know, the work is going on to know what is the function of a person, what a function is thinking without the use of MRI, because algorithms are now being built up by which looking at a patient and trying to analyze what is happening in the mind of a particular patient. Now, another issue which has come up in the neuroethics is several incidental findings which happened on the screening of an MRI. Suppose a person has been screened for a disorder, an incidental meningioma or pituitary adenoma or an aneurysm has been found or something else has been found. Whether to report it actually or not because it was not a concern of a person for which investigation has been done or one should keep a silence or if to inform under what kind of supervision and guidance where the person is fit to be informed or it will be producing a lot of, uh, uh, lot of uh, um, uh, tension in the mind of a person whose reports will be given. Now, similarly, unconscious patient, persistent vegetative state, minimally conscious state, locked in syndrome, there are now available literature which talks these patients still can understand and it can be regulated by the BCI, that is brain computer interface to perform some basic kind of uh, activities as well. Now, another interesting aspect of the ethics that is neuroethics is the neuro law. At least in India and in some part of the world also, as of, I know, the brain of, as we all know, the brain of a child is underdeveloped. And in India, we have a Juvenile Justice Act, which sees a crime done by a child under uh, age of uh, 16 with the leniency. They are not put to any punishment, but to any rehabilitations ground. Now, similar kind of a thing are now being debated for the adults also. Like uh, it has been found that many jail inmates, many perpetual criminals, they have had a bad trauma in their head long ago in their life, and they want to take a defense under similar kind of an act. So I am aware of judges now reading neurosciences to really try to understand whether the neuro law or the concept of law under the knowledge of uh, uh, neurosciences can help in them to really give a justice in situations like that. Lie detection and is another area which is being uh, coming up under the domain of neuroethics, whether it should be subjected, their reliability, and in what conditions it shall not be con conducted. Now, yet another area is training of the neurosurgeon resident, you know, simulation training. Like, for example, is simulation training is a correct method of training for the resident or uh, we should have a training on the human body. That's ethical debates which is going on. Now, I was uh, I was told by some of the people, senior neurosurgeons, that host neurosurgeon or the people doing the surgeries and going out of station and some people landing into trouble is also an ethical consideration which uh, shall be discussed by the neurosurgeons or regular interval. Now, another area which is being detected is the role of various brain stimulators like DBS for Parkinsonism, depression, OCD, and addiction. Does it really improve the condition? What are the long-term disadvantage of implanting the devices in the brain? Does it affect the personality? I am aware of people coming up, they, after 10 years or 15 years of their DBS, they are no considered as one is a failure of those devices. And then... Uh, the people is no longer the same what he what used to be and implanting those chips and devices is a you know is a or is a creation of a biosynergetic organization that is what literature says a humanoid creation from the human now that's another area of concern anesthesia of course awake craniotomy decompressive craniotomy like are we saving the life or prolonging the agony Euthanasia, like mercy killing or end of a medical science uh, uh, research ability. 
Awake can not mean no onco functional balance uh, or is it a neuromarketing kind of a neuromarketing for the surgeon? And these are the ethical neuroethical concerns which are emerging. So in short, I wanted to bring to the knowledge that what knowledge of ethics and the principle governing the neuroethics shall be debated whenever we are lured to a newer technology that can preserve brain function or can improve sub disability or improve the brain function further of a normal individual for who knows it may be an unintentional harm to our ability to think and pass our control to hands of various algorithms of the brain computer interface. So hence, as a neurosurgeon, I think it is very imperative and to understand that it is my responsibility that am I a part of a crime against humanity being conducted by virtue of adopting this neurotechnology? Am I implanting a device which can affect the autonomy of an individual or change autonomy in the future? Is my procedure, does my procedure disturb the balance between the benefit and no harm kind of ethical principle? Or am I a part of a herd of genius or the group of genius whose invention will further widen the social divide in the society? Like for example, if I implant a device which can improve the scholastic performance of a child, he was an average child, suddenly he becomes a genius by stimulating and planting with them. He starts producing the results which is far, far superior than what he used to do. This work is going on. Then what happens? Within the society, the people who can afford, who have money, they can afford, they will be able to use those devices, whereas the rest of the people, it may not be possible to think. So uh, you would like to be a part of that kind of genius group of people want to implant those devices, want to use those devices, which will widen the further gap. That is where it will be disturbing the social fabric uh, of uh, our society. I mean, with these words, I think thank you so much. It's a very dry talk, I know, but then I think thank you so much if I can uh, carry the message uh, to the limited audience which I have. Thank you work so much, Ishu, and thank you so much, Felicity. Thank you very much, Professor Singh, for this uh, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I think you, you brought up uh, uh, many questions that are uh, still puzzling. Uh, for every one of us, especially uh, nowadays. So I think we can start a discussion about your talk. Uh, I'm sure uh, the audience will have uh, uh, questions. I have actually uh, some questions. Maybe uh, I can start. Sure. Or, okay, then uh, I see also issue for sure has questions. So my, my first question is... Uh, about uh, uh, new surgical operations or techniques. Uh, you know, uh, operations are not like drugs, uh, which can be um, uh, checked in trials, uh, uh, in uh, uh, animals first, and then humans, and then you can, you can have a control group and treated group. Uh, so uh, in this era, nowadays, uh, where actually uh, we are taking so much care uh, about ethics and this is a duty for us and for our patients. Uh, how, in your opinion, can surgery improve and move further uh, respecting ethics? This is my first question. Because sometimes, you know, I also have uh, some uh, ideas about new approaches uh, and new techniques uh, but in some cases, uh, you wonder whether you are doing the right moves. And uh, the second question is about uh, adherence uh, to new strict uh, ethical regulations uh, of uh, neurosurgical uh, community, uh, which, uh, in my opinion, can make research more difficult. Uh, just to give you an example, if you want to publish a uh, a simple retrospective study, uh, you are often required by uh, journals uh, to give uh, ethical approval of the study, and not only ethical approval of the study, but also approval by patients. Uh, and often these patients uh, 
uh, are lost to follow up or even death. Uh, so it's uh, very difficult, even if uh, there is no way uh, for anyone to understand uh, the name uh, of the identity of the patient. So uh, what's the balance between the correct duty uh, for ethics and the possibility for scientists to do harmless uh, research? I think, Pilati, you asked two very pertinent questions. I am glad that you have uh, asked such questions. Now, the first question was, if you are adopting a newer technique or a newer operations for a benefit of a surgery, and uh, whether you are a bit, you are into the situation, whether I'm doing any kind of an ethical violation. Okay. Now, it's not a very simple question, and it cannot be answered in one simple straightforward because I will answer to you in a two different manners. So whenever you land up in a situation that am I doing some kind of an ethical imbalance or I'm, I'm uh, uh, doing something ethically wrong, go and debate yourself into the four basic principles of uh, ethics, that which I said, okay, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and the justice. Try to put up the, that question or that uh, debate or that kind of a technique which you are going, are you disturbing the, any one of them? And you will get the answer. Believe me, you will get the answer. That is how majority of the cases when the, there is a case is filed against ethical violations in various court of law, you know, their scrutiny is done by method of putting them into the four subsections. Now, suppose, let me say, if you are doing some surgery of a new technique of using some device for a removal of a glial tumor, let's say, for example. Okay. Now, the first question is, am I affecting the autonomy of a person? Answer is no. Of course, you want to use. Second is, is it going to be beneficial to the patient? Now, it depends what you are going to use. You have using, say, for example, using some device other than CUSA, something comes out to remove the tumor. Yes, you are using it for the benefit of the patient to remove the tumor. So nothing wrong. Answer two is there no, no, no effect on the benefices. Then third, non maleficence First, do no harm. Is that tool going to harm further over and above the established method of treatment? There comes a debate. Now, if you think there are, it's not likely to be there. There's nothing wrong. If you are not sure, then you put up a question for yourself. Okay. If you think, no, they, I have enough of uh, other body parts where this device has been used to remove the tumor. Why not I utilize it in the brain? Fine. It is not likely to be damaged. And the justice, it is not, does not arise in such situation. So new technique, new route of treatment, new can be approached going into those four cardinal principles. The next question was adherence to the regulation of uh, publications, you know, more so in the retrospective analysis, which you had raised the concern about, you know, we are also debating. Unfortunately, I realize that these are the objections of uh, publication and not of the treatment. Okay. Now, publisher associations across the world have come up the guidelines by themselves. And none of them is actually the person who is into the research. They are the publishers. They made those guidelines for some reasons to convince their authorities or maybe the legal sections that we are following this without discriminating between the prospective studies and the retrospective studies. So I think when we object to this by a larger forum, I'm very sure over a period of time, they will also amend those clause. Thank you, Professor. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, issue. issue? One. Yes. Sir. So thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk. And um, I never thought about neuroethics before that. I always believed in uh, taking consent, but uh, specifically uh, going for neuroethics, it was wonderful. So my, my question is like, uh, there are studies, uh, the various uh, doctors, they publish studies. And uh, we all know that uh, whenever we are uh, going for some new kind of treatment, we are sometimes biased that uh, this treatment will result into improvement. And this study is then published. 
and um, so the uh, new uh, the other persons who are not familiar with that kind of treatment now they are opting for that treatment so will this uh, adoption of new treatment which was already biased and now uh, the new uh, people they are following this kind of treatment will that result into uh, poor application of neuroethics and yes. let, let me simplify your question by like for example stem cells are being used right left and there and not without much of a studies being done by anybody okay people at least i know in india they are using stem cells in every disease now there are not, nothing is for and you know what happens is this is neuro marketing okay that is what i tried to say without having things you they know what is going to click that is marketing this is a terminology neuro marketing is there. this is absolute violations of ethics believe me there are no studies no particular one hand you know felati is asking if he wants to do a new surgical technique to improve upon on the other hand establishment on the other hand people are you know right left trying to use something which has not been even established even for a primary disease we all are lured to it okay and that luring is very beautiful you know that's neuroethics i mean this uh, marketing is so much so much going on that you know i there is no answer why people are getting lured unless we start uh, familiarizing unless we start educating people don't follow this this is a marketing gimmick people will continue to happen you know so i think your answer would be these 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 are all business gimmicks these are not uh, uh, scientifically proven uh, things and the business as well as uh, uh, science at times you know go side by side my second question is uh, what's your personal experience what you have felt that uh, these are specifically neuro marketing in your uh, complete experience like one is stem cell therapy and uh, sometimes my patients they ask me whenever patient is in vegetative state and they read on computer and then they come back and ask is there um, any treatment possible with stem cell therapy so what are the other uh, such kind of uh, business marketing or neuro marketing have you seen no actually i if i say even when we started having interest in ethics and all this terminology of neuro marketing is a new word now it has just been coined recently and you know i while i was reading i know that you know stimulation nucleus accumbens medial frontal lobe i didn't know all this that these are the site of pleasure hedonic cortex which are present and i think each and every device which is wrongly being propagated to sell like for example even today's newspaper says akshay tritya is coming up everybody wants to buy gold i mean i don't see the reason but then it is selling okay yes. so you know that's one example i mean the, the situation when you know the particular date is coming they want to sell a product in particular date only and there is a madness to purchase a particular items like gold in india in certain dates don't you think this is a neuro marketing they know how it is clicking so yes. that is some of the example and i think every days you can you can get more and more of such example in your day to day life if we start exploring more about it thank you sir thank you so uh, are there any questions or any comments professor yes yes so don't feel thank you so much it's thank quite you. it's quite uh, the, the difficult and the different topics for all of us thank you so much thank you but i think for the, the next generation uh, even the uh, residents uh, i think they should know and also uh, as a senior doctors how we can teach them uh, how we can treat of the the ethical uh the problem how we can teach them how, how they, they can join that's yeah, a very good thing, question yeah another thing is uh, Uh, we have so many vegetative patient and also and also the uh, some uh, uh, neuro issue uh, neuro ethics about uh, so uh, how can i say it and this this itself now we can choose so sometimes uh, the organ transplantation or some other things so oh if you have some uh, idea just let us know please yeah yeah thank, thank you very much thank wonderful you. talk yeah that's another two very important questions first was how to teach 
Now, I think uh, uh, very important for senior, uh, you know, uh, faculty to first get convinced by themselves that there is a need for us to educate our resident and junior faculty about the matter of concern, which uh, showcase our responsibility toward the society. Rather than you know teaching them how to make money, we should you know try to build up a, a society which would uh, to be of more progressive in nature, more human value. And I think next part is how to teach every curriculum of teaching, even right from the undergraduate to postgraduate and postdoctoral. I think it has to be imbibed right from the beginning rather than coming and teaching them at this stage. I am very sure in India, at least we have started by uh, incorporating the ethical learning right from the time when a student will join now the MBBS first year course. Okay, the ethical principle, awareness about the ethics and all. In addition, there are many places across the world, no conference is allowed to be held unless there is a chapter or a, uh, you know, some kind of a teaching uh, for about half an hour to one hour about some issues related to the ethics. And there is a discussion among the participating member also with the help of some ethics expert, some legal people, so that it, there is a larger discussion on these topics so that there is a wider clearance related to uh, ethical issues. Thirdly, I suppose uh, whenever we come across the people marketing certain product, let it be an implant, let it be a, a spinal implant, let it be a stimulator. We should ourselves start, you know, looking for those objections, which I think I just tried to raise. Uh, those angles should be, you know, concentrated a bit. Maybe we'll find answer uh, in, in us. So that's uh, 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 my answer would be to that. Second question was uh, issues related to vegetative patient and organ uh, transplantation. That's another very important thing. There is a you know, conflict of uh, ethics versus uh, the legal provisions of organ transplant in a particular country, right? Now, those legal provisions have been made, uh, it varies from one country to another country, uh, Take, keeping into the balance the need of organ, the law permitting euthanasia, as well as uh, uh, the, the emotional component related to a particular sections of uh, religion and all. I think that's a very, very difficult. Uh, we will have to find out answer based upon our local problems in that area. There cannot be a general answer for each of us. And I'm sure once we understand the essence of ethics and neuroethics, we will be able to find the solutions also within us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Albert? Thank you. I see uh, there is a question by uh, Professor Pirzad. Thank you. Hello. Uh, namaste. Yes. Uh, konnichiwa. Hello. Uh, greeting for everyone. That's uh, that's not a, a question, but it's a comment. Uh, we are faced uh, this issue in Afghanistan as well, and about the uh, ethics and neuroethics. And uh, uh, as the sciences change, the also the ethics has changed some topics and uh, the. Uh, Actually, with the new techniques, new technology, and new methods, and for this we must uh, like uh, uh, thank you for uh, Professor Diljit Singh. It was really uh, good and best lecture, and uh, we must also teach the doctors. The uh, we must also uh, teach and. Uh, uh, have public awareness about some uh, neuromarketing. It's very important because uh, sometimes in media there is a uh, research uh, results uh, like 95% success rate. And uh, when we see that the uh, especially the low and middle income countries where are, they are going to uh, high. Uh, uh, and middle income countries for uh, treatment, especially like uh, spinal cord injury patients. And when they're facing uh, that's the reading that's 95% success rate, 
And when the stem cells fail, they told that you are in 5%. And, That's marketing. Uh, That's exactly neuromarketing. Yes, yes. Exactly. That's okay. Uh, okay, thank you. We also must have some uh, uh, force on media as well. And uh, when uh, some neuroethics uh, committee uh, uh, do some uh, issue about the, this neuromarketing and also the, about the media, then they must publish their uh, results. Thank you very much. Thank you for this comment. So if uh, there are no other questions, or comments, we can maybe move to uh, the second talk uh, scheduled for today. Uh, so uh, the second talk uh, uh, is uh, uh, about a very uh, interesting topic. And our speaker is Dr. Dragan Jankovic, who is a 40-year uh, neurosurgery resident. Uh, he uh, graduated and started his uh, neurosurgical residency program uh, in Croatia, and then he moved uh, to, uh, to Marburg, University of Marburg in Germany, uh, under the supervision of Professor uh, Nimsky. And uh, in 2020, he uh, joined the University Medical Center of Mainz in Germany, uh, where he still works uh, in the team of Professor uh, Florian Ringel. Uh, he's a PhD student uh, uh, in neuroscience. He's author and co-author of several scientific papers uh, in international uh, journals. Uh, and he uh, also talking at several conferences and congresses. He is a reviewer for uh, the World Neurosurgery. Uh, he uh, has a specific interest uh, in vascular neurosurgery and neuro-oncology. And uh, he is going to talk today uh, about uh, uh, the role of uh, hemodynamics in uh, intracranial aneurysms. So I invite uh, Dr. Dragan Jankovic uh, to uh, deliver his uh, talk. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Fedetti, thank you very much for your introduction. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, dear Professor uh, Fedetti, Professor Tato, I am uh, very honored to, to be able to uh, have a lecture today at, um, at Fujita Alumni um, webinar. Uh, my topic today is the role of hemodynamic uh, in the intracranial aneurysm. So cerebral ane uh, aneurysms carry a high risk of, the, of rupture and so present a major um, threat to the patient's life. Accurate criteria for the predicting aneurysm rupture are important for therapeutic um, decision making, and some clinical and morphological factors may help to predict um, the risk of the rupture of unruptured aneurysm, such as sex, uh, size, or location. Um, prediction of um, aneurysm is complex, it's very difficult. And intra, we can say that intracranial aneurysm is a result of hemodynamic forces on the, on the wall of the intracranial artery. Hemodynamic forces are considered to be key in the natural history of uh, cerebral aneurysms. But the effect on the aneurysm rupture is entertained. Uh, uh, and whether low or the high wall stress is the most critical in promoting uh, rupture remains extremely um, controversial. Um, recent experimental and engineering computational data suggest that hemodynamics play a critical role in development, in growth, in initiation, and rupture of cerebral aneurysm. So, um, unfortunately, um, due to a lack um, of standardized methodology, controversy remains on um, each parameter's role. So today I want to discuss with you, um, where you are expert, the, the, the current status of the uh, computer fly dynamics um, research that may play an important role in clinical neurosurgery. And I want also to, uh, based on the literature, to evaluate the current role of the uh, computer fluid dynamics as a predictor of um, aneurysm rupture.
Um, in the human vascular system, uh, the state of, of blood flow um, can be divided in, in, two, in two graphs. So laminar flow and uh, turbulent flow according to the velocity and geometrical parameter. Laminar flow uh, is mainly distributed in the vertical vessels with large diameter, while turbulent flow is mainly distributed in the small and curved vessels. Under turbulent state, the blood flow, flow velocity is relatively high and the geometrical parameter is more complex, which causes mechanical force to the blood vessels ball. Under the continuous abnormal uh, flow stimulation, the function of the endothel um, cells is disordered and becomes the in uh, initiating factors of the infracranial aneurysm development. Later, you can see that on the, on, on the picture, uh, later the migration of the vascular smooth, uh, smooth muscle cells and its apoptosis accompanied with inflammatory and uh, cell uh, infiltration can result in degradation of uh, vascular wall leading to the progression and eventual uh, rupture of uh, infracranial aneurysm. So recent research uh, in molecular biology and engineering uh, suggests that um, an intracranial aneurysm developed due to disruption of hemostatic balance in arterial walls induced by excessive uh, hemodynamic stress. Um, stress. On this picture, on, on figure, uh, we can see schematic presentation of the effects of the uh, vessel wall tension and shear stress on endothelial cells. So while tension develops in response to transmural pressure gradients and cause cell stretch with cell deformation in all direction. Shear stress uh, is the fluid force, frictional force acting at the apical surface on the uh, endothelial cells and shear stress can result in unidirectional cell deformation. Uh, different local um, flow conditions uh, in different and local um, arteries can, could, uh, could be an important factor in the development of, uh, of the aneurysm. Um, many study um, reports the influence, the impact of the uh, hemodynamic uh, stress uh, as a risk factor in relation to possible uh, rupture. Some authors reported that distribution of the oscillatory wall shear stress uh, was higher in uh, rupture uh, compared to unruptured aneurysm and that the arteries uh, were more elongated. Another study found a higher as morphological parameters such as aspiration uh, aspect ratio, uh, lower wall shear stress, mean oscillatory index OCI, and in the these uh, um, rupture group. According to the analysis, we have a, a strong correlation between risk of the rupture, the size of the aneurysm, and the local fluid dynamics in the dome. To conduct the precise CSF analysis, we need a high quality 3D data set. That's a fundamental. We need a high resolution image such as digital the DSA or 3D angiography. And after obtaining the DICOM data set, the computation of volumetric mesh is generated. So we have a few softwares. Um, in USA, in Europe, we, we use uh, ANSI software. We have now uh, more uh, FLOM, we have, we, we have a hemoscope. And when CSF, uh, the computer fluid dynamic simulation for prediction of uh, aneurysm rupture is performed, it is important to know whether or not the ge uh, geometry was reconstructed from the pre-rupture uh, uh, pre, pre aneurysm imaging because the geometry uh, might be changed after rupture and that will be produce hemodynamic difference. 
due to difficulty of the obtaining patient specific data, physiological inf uh, information such as blood pressure, flow velocity, blood uh, viscosity, and the heart rate are usually fixed as an uniform condition for the CSF analysis. Some study uh, use also fluid structure inter interaction, FSI analysis, uh, to stimulate vessel transformation during pulsation and elasticity of the blood vessels was considered in the majority of study was, was be or to be good. And the uh, FSI analysis um, contains very complex uh, computational techniques to, uh, and their result was also depend on the thickness and elastic modulus of the, of the vessels. Uh, and all is difficult to obtain by common uh, diagnostic uh, imaging. When we talk about hemodynamic parameters, we have, if I have here uh, four, four uh, important parameters. First of all, uh, while shear stress. While shear stress, we all know, is frictional force on the arterial wall produced by uh, blood flow uh, in a direction towards to uh, uh, a local tangent plane and is described uh, in, the, in the equation. Uh, so while stress is frictional force contributes to biological reaction occurring on the parent artery or aneurysm uh, wall. The second one is the oscillatory shear index. Um, the OSI uh, measures the directional change of wall stress during the cardiac cycle and the OSI becomes larger with, with larger angle for, of, of uh, Walsh stress direction. And um, it is often used to describe the disturbance of the flow field. Um, previous study reported a higher OSI was observed in rupture than in unruptured aneurysm, or high OSI correspondent to the rupture point. Third one is uh, pressure deference. Pressure deference is defined as degree of pressure elevation at the aneurysm wall. And the last one is pressure loss coefficient. Um, this parameter indicates whether the blood flows easily, so I mean without resistance, through the aneurysm, or what is the quantitative expression of the easiness, for example. For example, uh, pressure loss efficient decreases if the shape of the uh, vessels and aneurysm facilitates the, the, the easy flow of blood. Uh, here we have a, a table with, 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 um, with some publication from, um, from 2009, in period from 2009 to 2016. So when we see the table, uh, surely someone will ask, why is while she is stressed uh, by uh, uh, in Castro uh, research study uh, high and uh, why is by Xiang or Takao da Miura um, um, low? So, however, um, controversial results uh, of both high or, or and low, low uh, while she is stressed have been reported to be correlated with, uh, with uh, aneurysm rupture. Some researchers reported that a higher while shear stress was observed in ruptured compared to the, to the um, unruptured aneurysm. And what is interesting that others reported the opposite finding. So that's why I will discuss. So Zebra um, and authors reported that um, high while shear stress is related to the aneurysm rupture. High was stress at thin and hard aneurysm wall areas was most involved with rupture. Other researchers, uh, other researchers have reported that aneurysms rupture because blood flow on the aneurysm wall produced high was stress. But on the other side, some um, reports such as Fukazawa. Uh, and uh, authors um, reported that aneurysm ruptures because they could no longer sustain the arterial pressure due to regeneration and thinning of the arterial walls caused by low um, wall shear stress. 
we have a, a large studies with more than 100 patients by Tsang Wing Siang. They performed both uh, CSZ analysis uh, and statistical test for, uh, for a total of 173 and 204 aneurysms, including ruptured and uh, unruptured aneurysm. They also reported that aneurysm, aneurysmal rupture had a strong relationship to hemodynamic and morphological parameters such as low wash distress, high oscillatory index, and size ratio. So my question was, can both values be a predictor of rupture? But um, Meng in American Journal of Nervous Neuroradiology uh, hypothesized that uh, high wall shear stress and a positive wall shear stress gradient can trigger mural uh, cell mediated destructive remodeling and other side low wall shear stress and high OC can trigger inflammatory cell mediated. First of all, high wall shear stress at the blood flow zone is related to the initiations of aneurysm development. After uh, aneurysm development, its growth process differs depending on whether Walsh stress is high or low. If the Walsh stress is high, it causes um, the generation of the cellular matrix and uh, cell apoptosis and an may rupture even if they small in size. Other side, if the Walsh stress is low, the aneurysm may become larger because inflammation caused by slow reticulation and disturbed flow environment promotes the promotion of uh, atherosclerotic plaques, which then exacerbate the inflammatory cells. So low study um, reported that low Walsh stress has been frequently association, uh, associated with upregulation of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin-1, interleukin-6, uh, interleukin-1a um, uh, on MCP, and that seems to be associated with intracranial rupture. Uh, also, aneurysm will rupture or stabilize depending on the temporal spatial uh, while she stress alteration accompanied by geometrical change of the aneurysm. So at the end, uh, Meng indicated that cause of the leading um, controversial um, reports uh, in the last decade on while she stress depends on the difference in the natural history of each analyzed aneurysm. Um, I want to say something also about intraoperative rupture uh, of aneurysm um, and hemodynamic. We know that we have three stages according to Biter and Samson uh, of intraoperative rupture. So that's early or pre-section stage, dissection stage and clip application stage. And however, science, there is no good method to study hemodynamic in intraoperative uh, rupture. We have only few related studies, retrospective, who explored risk factors uh, such as surgical experience may affect the risk or pre-surgical um, rupture is our high risk for for uh, intracranial, uh, intra orbit, uh, intra um, operative uh, rupture. We have also a few, a few morpho uh, morphological studies. Um, uh, for example, Dar found a relationship between the um, aspect ratio and the risk uh, of the nature rupture of intracranial aneurysm. Uh, Gu and authors found also that intracranial aneurysm with a larger aspect ratio. Uh, have a higher uh, risk for um, of uh, intraoperative uh, rupture. Uh, given this, the main proposed that um, low wall shear, uh, wall shear stress could cause apoptosis, endothelial injury, and inflammatory infiltration. And those pathological factors could result in a fragile aneurysm valve. It can be seen that an intraoperative rupture aneurysm 
had has an uh, an unique uh, morphological and hemodynamic uh, features by analyzing the morphological and hemodynamic characteristics of intraorbital uh, intraoperative uh, sorry um, uh, rupture aneurysms a morphological parameter and two uh, hemo and, and two hemodynamic parameter related to the intraoperative uh, uh, rupture were found, such as aspect ratio, such as wall field stress, and such as uh, size ratio. When we talk about uh, uses of, of the computation of fluid dynamics in clinical practice, we have to know that aneurysm rupture is a multifactorial phenomenon that may not be predicted by a single parameter. The effect of mental and physical uh, st stress may contribute as well, and blood, blood pressure elevation can be triggered also for rupture, but some factors such as size, such as aneurysm size, uh, location, uh, presence of the other sac and certain other morphological uh, condition can be classified as high or the low risk, risk in terms of uh, rupture using current computer fluid dynamics technology. Computer fluid dynamics analysis has also been performed in neuroradiology to evaluate the eff uh, effectiveness of device such as flow diverter uh, stents or uh, uh, embolic cause after the intervention by observing the blood flow chains between uh, pre and post device application in the treated aneurysm. Some authors analyze that the blood flow of the, of the flow diverter stent and aneurysm in 15 cases, including 10 aneurysms occlusions and five, uh, um, and and five partial occlusions, they result that uh, there is a higher reduction rate in vortex core line length and energy loss occurred for the complete occlusional case. It was also discussed uh, that the uh, effectiveness of the flow diverter stent and coil technique from the results uh, of computer fluid dynamics. Um, very important is estimation of um, recognition risk. Uh, it's also be uh, has been um, attempted using um, CFD and some papers and some authors reported that mass flow rate into uh, the aneurysm before coiling was a significant risk factor for recanalization in, for example, in this paper, um, Basler type aneurysms. And what is the future of hemodynamic studies? Future of hemodynamic studies, simulations, and um, aneurysm rupture prediction um, should be a multidisciplinary including, including um, mechanical and molecular studies, basic studies, patient clinical information, and also advanced stimulation such as computer fluid dynamics, such as um, FSI. And I think this is the only, only in this way we can get the, 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 the right results and right predictors for uh, intracranial aneurysm. Thank you very much for mind. And I'm ready for expert comments and questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jankovic, for uh, this interesting uh, presentation about an uh, intriguing topic. Uh, I worked uh, uh, in Japan with Professor Kato uh, for some months about CFD, and I, I found that it's actually a, a promising technique. Uh, so uh, is there any question uh, from the audience? I see Itichai raised uh, his hand. So please, Itichai. Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, uh, thank you for Dr. Dagan for your presentation. It's really beautiful and very clear. Uh, for, for, for my question, uh, regarding uh, today, 
uh, we have an uh, increased number of the young population of uh, intracranial aneurysm rupture. I, I want to ask you uh, how about the difference uh, part for uh, hemodynamics of intracranial aneurysm between the young uh, patient and the old patient? Uh, can, can you uh, like uh, apply for the CFD? You, you can use this in this group of patients? Uh, you hear me? Yes, yes, yes I, can I can hear you. Uh, uh, I not found, I, not, uh, I have to say this, I not found uh, just uh, um, a study, just uh, research, uh, just a young population. So uh, all, all, all uh, studies that um, I read and, and that I saw was so uh, population, uh, adult population, so from uh, age range, 20 to, to 80 or the 90. Uh, but I, I, I didn't saw uh, some papers just with young population. I have no ex 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 experience just with, with young population. And Professor Singh raised his hand. It was a very nice presentation. I mean, I was actually debating what is the actual clinical application of uh, such a test. What you have today, flow dynamics may change tomorrow or maybe day after tomorrow because it's not a constant, it's a dynamic process which is happening in the aneurysm and that is what it, maybe at 6 a.m. may be different from the 6 p.m. In what real sense uh, it is going to be useful for the patient? Suppose if I do a flow dynamics of the patient and I find that it is unlikely to rupture because the parameters are not suggesting. Is this patient actually safe by virtue of flow dynamics analysis? Comment on that, please. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, very uh, interesting. So, um, I think that is for 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 doctors, for residents, for for studies, uh, for research, um, important. So that is such as uh, um, augmented reality or so that uh, for patient, I can say association, uh, for example, for a radiological, uh, preoperative, postoperative um, procedure uh, after stenting, after coiling uh, for estimation, the, the, the recognition risk, I think that's, that's important for, for a patient. Uh, directly, uh, so for unwrapped, I don't. I uh, I think that is just for for research, for research, and for outcome. For outcome, I think that that uh, I don't found uh, something something new. Yeah? Or maybe we devise some new device which can, uh, you know, like a pacemaker kind of a thing. It doesn't allow the blood to go into that area. You know direct to some other direction rather than the direction into the aneurysm or possibly we never know yeah maybe in the future we have devices which can you know that you know change the direction of the stream of the uh, blood from the aneurysm to the main vessel and you know uh, no need to put any device just uh, do the flow regulation by externally controllable devices i'm just kidding hypothesizing you never know thank you very much Yes, I think this is a very interesting point. Actually, it was also my question. So how how to uh, you know uh, use uh, uh, CFD to to uh, predict uh, and to advise patients? So probably we need more research yes. to use it uh, in a clinical setting. I see Adi uh, raised his hand. Uh, thank you, Alberto, for uh, and thank you, Dr. Dragan, for a great, excellent talk. Uh, since this is uh, your PhD thesis, uh, I see that you are um, becoming an expert in the field of the computational fluid dynamics. Uh, also, I would love to use this opportunity to um, recommend Dr. Dragan to uh, Professor Kato, uh, since all of us are members of Fujita and we visited Japan and we had the, this great fellowship. Uh, I would uh, suggest Professor Kato to accept 
Dr. Dragan, and maybe Dr. Dragan can uh, enlarge his studies with the Hemoscope software, which we have used. Uh, and also my question is related as all of us uh, have the same um, issue. When we have the patient with the three and four millimeters aneurysm, unruptured, they, you know, those, those aneurysms are um, in limited size. So uh, there is always a question uh, from the patient, uh, how big is my risk that my aneurysm in this size will rupture? So uh, my question is how the CFD could in the future help us to decide, are we gonna go to treat these uh, small aneurysms, three to four millimeters, or we will uh, just observe the patient during the time. And thank you, Dr. Dragan. So thank you, Eddie. Thank you for your comments and thank you for your questions. Your questions. So I think that that we need a more more research and more study with patient with 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 uh, four four millimeter aneurysm to make a, a, a one group for for patient with follow up to can conclude that we have uh, something to say to patient why actually in, in in literature i don't i don't i don't saw uh, the the large study with 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 large patient with 4 mm aneurysm with follow up from 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 5 year uh, for example so we just i think this this we are just on the begin for an uh, csf era and that we all need need to collect all our patients and 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 to make a one who follow up. Uh, but I think that is uh, very important to to uh, to this basic uh, basic molecular biological uh, uh, such as uh, interleukin. And and I think that that that's, I think that uh, interleukin uh, it it is possible to to. To uh, also blood samples, and then we can that's all uh, that all uh, uh, group here, and, and and I think that's that's that CSF is really CSS is is really uh, future, and but I think also the CSF is we can we can not do just uh, our research just with the CSF we 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 made to so all other risk factors. Uh, in in study involved and and I think this these are uh, uh, inflammatory markers and uh, sarcopenia markers this all is wichty, uh, all is very important and uh, I think that's the future and we will uh, I think we will stay we, we will stay on 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 this way with 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 uh, dynamics yes I also the, the last point uh, you you uh, point out uh, uh, is very important uh, so to uh, correlate uh, CFD with other parameters like uh, neuroinflammation so it's important to maybe take samples from the operated uh, aneurysms and match uh, the the histology with uh, preoperative uh, CFD results and probably also in my opinion uh, it would be important to uh, improve uh these softwares because uh, right now cfd is focused only on the vessels uh properties but vessels and aneurysms uh depends on also on the environment so is the aneurysm uh close to the brain is it uh, fully in the cistern so i think probably new softwares uh, should try to include also the environmental uh, features. Uh, is there any other question for uh, Dr. Jankovic? Yes, I have ready. I think, yeah. oh, and, and also Hi. Dr. Shubin, yes. Hi. Hi, uh, Dr. Draga. Very nice presentation. But uh, just as uh, <clears throat> Albert mentioned, uh, because uh, uh, the aneurysm uh, in uh, on the patient. Not only uh, we can consider the interlumen parameters, like uh, you mentioned, uh, of the hemodynamic uh, parameters, but also the surrounding structures, like uh, nerves, some uh, systems, some uh, brain tissue, and uh, 
actually <clears throat> we can also uh, in our uh, acute subarachnoid hemorrhage patients when you do the angiogram uh, you may find uh, around 80 or to 85 percent is a, a aneurysm uh, rupture but uh, another 10 or 12 uh, or to 15 percent uh, we couldn't find any uh, uh, bleeding cause. Actually, when you do the uh, clipping uh, surgery, you can find some weak point on the vessel wall, just like the, the window on the uh, plane's cabin. You know, a, a small, you can you can uh, see the blood flow in into the uh, artery. You can see it, uh, and this is a very weak point. Actually, this kind of uh, weak point, the shear stress, and uh, uh, I think the is the uh, same as a uh, 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 healthy uh, artery wall, but uh, there's still is a weak point and may also cause uh, uh, arachnoid, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, actually after uh, another uh, condition, like uh, we treated the uh, AVM combined with uh, uh, proximal aneurysms, sometimes we only treated the distal AVM nidus. We uh, actually the proximal aneurysm can, uh, can be healed automatically, spontaneously. Sometimes uh, like uh, I also did some distal clipping <clears throat> for a giant pica aneurysm. It's originated from a very small vessel uh, of pica. The diameter is only one, one millimeter about. But the aneurysm uh, sac is around uh, two centimeter. So the diameter is a uh, two centimeter. But after I clip the distal uh, <clears throat> part of the pica, after half a year, you know what? The aneurysm totally cured. <laughs> it's totally disappeared. So. Actually, aneurysm, uh, in my opinion, is a uh, it's a balance between the uh, hemodynamic changes and uh, also uh, our uh, we have also some uh, healing factors. We are not very clear what's uh, what's the me mechanism. So it's uh, between the uh, rupture uh, factors and the healing factors, it's a balance. And actually, after uh, uh, looking back to the history, uh, sometimes we, uh, some SH uh, patients with uh, uh, aneurysm, sometimes they didn't take the clipping surgery but they can very stable in several years after the first uh, rupture. Actually, for this kind of aneurysm, the hemodynamic uh, factors is the same, but it can be very stable, uh, maybe in 10, even 20 years. So it's a very complicated uh, uh, disease, not only uh, this uh, hemodynamic uh, factors, it's also, it's a very important aspect, but uh, it's not a, uh, it's a not a very, uh, it's a important uh, aspect, but not total for we can predict the rupture. Thank you for this uh, yeah. comment, uh, Professor Shubin. Yes, probably CFD is uh, one piece of a big puzzle, uh, right? Yeah. So it's uh, important like uh, other factors, uh, uh, external risk factors, uh, smoking or whatever, 
yeah. then the envi environment, uh, arachnoid or brain or nerves. Uh, CFD is another piece of this puzzle, uh, of a complicated puzzle. Yeah, uh, I think uh, issue also wanted to say something. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dragon, for this nice presentation. And uh, I have some suggestions like uh, CFD can be used to predict uh, future aneurysm sites. Uh, and uh, that can be done in a case of uh, incidentally detected aneurysm. You can look for different kind of wall shear stress at uh, bifurcation points. And those points can predict the origin of a new aneurysm at those points. And there have been studies on uh, this um, idea. And the, one study was also done at Japan about uh, probability of rupture. They took sample of uh, small size aneurysms and did CFD. And uh, they predicted that uh, if the uh, CFD parameters uh, they were low for uh, rupture. They followed up those patients and uh, the, those aneurysms, they didn't increase in size or uh, the rupture was not uh, found in those cases. So that can answer the uh, question that in a small size aneurysm, like 4 mm or less than 4 mm aneurysm, should we observe or should we go for clipping? CFD might be and become a tool to uh, help us in uh, predicting whether we should go for clipping or uh, clipping or coiling in those kind of aneurysms, depending upon their parameters, if they suggest rupture or no rupture. So these are my suggestions. Okay. Thank you, Ishu. I think that, that we have uh, just one question from uh, uh, F and A. Yeah, there is one question in question and answers. Uh, yes, uh, yes, there is a question uh, think... uh, in the chat. Uh, could the CFD uh, be applied to permisencephalic aneurysm with negative DSA to determine the possible vessel tear? So, I don't with... know what, what, what expert mean, but I, uh, I think no, uh, if you use DSA on which we know aneurysm was found. It is not possible to see it on on CFD, but CFD is based on uh, CTA or or of DSA. Yeah, I probably. Think. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's not uh, it's not a key point uh, in case of uh, negative yeah. uh, DSA and uh, and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Yeah. Probably it, it has not, CFD has not the power enough to, to detect uh, uh, the possible vessel tear point. Yeah. Is there any other comment or question? Professor uh, Yoko Kato, maybe uh, you want to, to say something about uh, <laughs> Dr. Jankovic's uh, talk and uh, also summary, final summary. Okay, thanks, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, the two talks was uh, excellent. So I am very satisfied with the two talks, and uh, uh, especially the, uh, the dragon. Uh, thank you very much for your nice talk. Uh, the, mm -hmm. Most of the patient who has uh, unruptured anus want to know my anus will be ruptured in future or not. That is most concern of patients. And also, uh, we have uh, more than 300 uh, anus cases per year. So the every case is we uh, make uh, CFD, but I think uh, uh, it is not a, not a, a good match because we expected this part should be very thin, this part should be very thick, but the intraoperative the findings is sometimes uh, totally different. And also, uh, the morphology is very important for uh, expecting the rupture in the future. But I think already Dr. Shubin, he mentioned, so time to time, is the uh, aneurysm morphology and also the hemodynamic is changing. 
So the once a patient has blip, so everybody think so blip is very dangerous. So that's why we should do the surgery, even small. But uh, uh, sometimes we uh, uh, encounter because uh, uh, some such kind of the blip is uh, not hundred percent the red one. Sometimes very yellow, very sick uh, the blip we can find. So I think uh, uh, so the time to time change uh, that means is uh, you mentioned about apoptosis or some other uh, the macrophage invasion or some uh, uh, degenerative uh, uh, has happened. So I, I think uh, remodeling of the aneurysm. So uh, that, that that's why I, I think uh, it's quite uh, uh, how can I say still. Uh, we, we cannot sure that if the CFD, the only, it is very viable one. So uh, maybe uh, I think we need more uh, uh, the study, the further study. And we are not radiologists, we are neurosurgeons. So we can see that the aneurysm itself during the surgery. And also you can cut, and you can check the histology and the spacement. Uh, we, are, we are very lucky to study both. And once the uh, doctor issued that he came to us, that he uh, studied about the microvascular decompletion. So the, the which part of the uh, offending vessels to, uh, to uh, compress the nerve. So he uh, found the, the hot spot of the vessels. I think uh, the CFD is uh, of course a good uh, the survey of the aneurysm, the future rupture, but I think uh, uh, CFD is uh, another application. I think. So maybe uh, Dr. Ishu, that he remembered, you studied a lot about uh, microvascular decompletion. Yes, Professor. I yes. So, yeah, so maybe I, I, the Yankovic, maybe I can expect your father investigation and tell us the uh, the CFD is uh, more the relation with the, the you mentioned about the, some uh, biological or some other factors uh, and more uh, reliable result for uh, future rupture. And also just you can tell us the uh, st strong the wall of the aneurysm. So which part is a strong, which part is the, uh, the weak? That's what we want to know. Thank you very much for your nice lecture. And also, thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, the professor, uh, uh, <clears throat> Dalfit. So it's very unique, but very, very important for all the, uh, the neurosurgeons uh, issue, I think. So the, uh, you can tell us more uh, in the, in, in the uh, next webinar or study uh, chance. Thank you so much. Yeah. We had a very nice uh, webinar today. Thank you, Professor Yokokato, uh, for these final uh, comments. Uh, I want to thank uh, again our speakers, uh, Professor Singh and uh, Dr. Jankovic, for very interesting and insightful presentations. Uh, thank you to all, uh, all of you uh, for your questions and comments. Thank you, Professor Shubin, for joining uh, our webinar. Uh, thank you to uh, issue Bishnoi, my co-moderator uh, and co-organizer uh, of this meeting. And uh, have a good uh, night or day, depending on where you are in the world. And see you next time for the next uh, Fujita Alumni Association webinar. Thank you very much.